Hi everyone, I have been promising to share how to turn maybe an unwanted cross stitch, I hate to say unwanted, but we want to breathe some life into maybe some of those pieces that are sticking in your unfinished pile of finished cross stitch pieces. And I actually stitched this a couple years ago. Mm, yeah, maybe. And um, there were a couple of things I, I hesitate to say wrong with it, but things that maybe I wish I had done differently. It was on a much bigger count than what I actually stitch on now, but I did not want to let it just sit and go to waste. And so I thought, why not turn it into a project bag, something useful, something that I can use to house some summer stitches in. And so today I'm gonna to share with you how to turn this cross stitch pattern from Cherry Hill Stitchery into a project bag. And I hope it inspires you to maybe take some of those cross stitch pieces sitting in a basket or in a tote in your craft room into project bags for yourself. So if you are interested in seeing how I took this and turned it into this, then stay tuned. Hello everyone. So I have been wanting to share this for a while. We are going to turn a cross stitch that I stitched a while ago on a fabric that I really don't want to finish into anything else. Um, I've talked about this before. This is a Cherry Hill Stitchery. I think it's called Sweet Summer. I will link it um, here in the supplies really really cute now the reason I wanted to turn this into a project bag is it is stitched on 25 count which I don't particularly um, stitch on or love to do for my finishing anymore but I love this stitch so what I thought would be a really good use for this design would be to turn it into my summer project bag. I thought, wouldn't it be adorable? And so today I'm gonna to show you how I'm gonna turn this into my project bag. Um, I don't exactly know what I'm gonna be doing. <laughs> uh, we're gonna make it up as we go along. I will include all of the details down in the description below if you wanna do something similar with some cross stitch finishes that maybe you have that you have decided not to maybe turn into home decor. And I do wanna mention this letter S, I think I must have stitched in a different black than the rest of the letters. I know I've talked about this in other whip parades before and things like that. I chose not to tear it out and it's gonna be in a project bag and it just doesn't matter that much to me. I don't think it's gonna take away from the project bag at all all. So I did want to make that super clear before we get started. So I have pulled out an assortment of fabric. I do not have exact sources for these. I don't know how much of this we're actually going to end up using. Anything that I do know what brand or what collection it's from, I will put in the supplies. But I will tell you all of these fabrics are in, a. I have a couple of bins of fabric that I buy bundles from like Primrose Cottage or places like that. And I know all of these were um, curated bundles from Primrose Cottage. So that's where all of these came from. Mostly I'm just pulling reds, greens, and black and whites. Stuff that really, you know, emphasizes my stitch. And I have some um, of the Riley Red Large Vintage Trim from Lori Holt that I think we're going to frame up this strip. So let's go ahead, before we dive into our fabric, let's measure our piece. So I wanted to, I'm gonna use this kind of small ruler here. This is a four and a half by eight and a half ruler. And you can see my design is eight and a half by, mm, I don't know, three and three quarters, it looks like. So I need to cut it a little bigger. I'm actually gonna grab a little bit bigger ruler 
and I definitely don't want to cut it too small if that makes sense so I am going to look at this and I think we're going to start let's say three quarters of an inch or so from the bottom most stitches, which it looks like it's about right here. And I'm going to just cut off the extra at the top and the bottom. I'm not gonna shorten my strip quite yet. So then I'm gonna look at this I'm actually going to flip this around so it's a little easier. I had to get out the big ruler because this is kind of a big girl. All right. One, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five. I want it to be five inches tall. Reason being, I'm hoping to do patchwork two and a half inch squares. So I think that that will work the best. So let's just go ahead you know, measure twice, cut once, and we can remove that excess fabric. So for now, let's do that, and we've trimmed down our stitch. And I'm not going to sew this quite yet. I want to figure out the width of my bag, but I'm fairly certain Fairly certain we're gonna decorate our bag up a little bit here today. So, you know, a little rick rack, we'll have patchwork. I think that'll be super cute. Okay, let's go ahead and cut a bunch of two and a half inch squares. So I have a bunch of fat quarters here as I showed a minute ago. And to speed up and save a little bit of time, I am going to cut three at a time. I wasn't entirely sure how I wanted to do my patchwork, but I knew I didn't want to go back and be recutting multiple squares, like trying to figure out what color and all of that. So what I ended up doing was from all of these fat quarters, all of the ones that you saw here a minute ago in the video, I am going to cut two and a half inch strips and cut two and a half inch squares from all of them. Um, and I am just going to cut a lot of squares. Surprisingly enough, here in a minute, you're going to see all of the squares. And I thought there is no way I will even use a fraction of these. But because I'm choosing to do patchwork on the back as well, I did not have that many left over. Probably enough to, you know, do some sort of little patchwork on maybe a pillow finish or something in the future, but literally I did not end up with near as many two and a half inch squares left over as I thought. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut up the rest of this fabric and then we'll start sewing. Okay, so I did a tester row after I, I die cut way more squares than I actually need. We may patchwork the back too because of that. But I did a ton so I could really have an assortment, but I did a tester row just kind of to gauge width. And I think I'm actually not going to piece anything here on the sides like I thought. I think we're gonna leave it like this. It'll get trimmed it down a little bit and we're going to do our rickrack at the top and the bottom. So what I'm gonna do now is basically figure out the rest of my patchwork. Um, I probably should have really sorted these into designs, but we're going to kind of just play with the layout until we get it how we like. And then I'm gonna sew the rest of these rows together and I will show you exactly how I'm going to do that. 
So I'm over here at my sewing machine now and what I did was I had laid out on the other side of my desk, kind of in front of my sewing machine, I had laid out all of my two and a half inch squares in the order I wanted and picking them up row by row, I am chain piecing those together using my quarter inch foot on my Juki and I cannot sew without it. I love my quarter inch foot. And this way I was able to keep those squares in the order I had them laid out. I am notorious for forgetting <laughs> what order I have things. So I found it easiest to just go square or row by row, pardon me, and piece them together. I ironed each row in alternating directions so that I could nest the seams together and sew them together. There will be one patchwork row above my cross stitch and one or two patchwork rows below my cross stitch. And down in the description, I will um, have the measurements like what my bag ends up measuring because I did roughly follow my snowman bag, so I will link that here. Uh, if you haven't checked out my snowman bag tutorial, you can check that out um, if you would like. So it's roughly that size and it's that style of bag. So if you like the no binding and no exposed seams type of project bag, you may wanna check that out. There are difference between my previous bag and this one is this one will feature soft and stable. So you'll notice that I didn't include the ironing in my video, but I'm ironing them alternate ways. Then I'm making sure the seams nest really well, pinning it and sewing it together. On my cross stitch strip, I have some of the Riley Red Vintage trim. I am lining up one of the hills of the rickrack with the edge of my cross stitch panel piece. Remember it measures five inches wide and using a scant quarter inch seam. I definitely don't want to use a quarter inch seam. I don't want that to show. I am sewing my rickrack in place. Now I really wanted to make sure that this was going to work. I have left my cross stitch border much wider longer, <laughs> not wider, longer than what I need. And I am going to go ahead and pin my patchwork in place at the top, eyeballing it to get that centered. And then I am using a quarter inch seam to attach my patchwork border to the top of my strip. Now, once I have that, oh, that looks so cute. I love the little um, rickrack trim peeking out. I will give that a really good press. Let's go ahead and attach the bottom rickrack. I want it to be framed up on both the top and the bottom. The difference between um, adding the patchwork to the top and the bottom is before I attach the rest of my patchwork, I will take this over to my cutting mat and I am going to square this up and go ahead and remove any excess just to kind of eliminate in case it doesn't get lined up perfectly because it's so super long. So I just found it best to come over here, kind of make sure everything is squared up and remove that extra. There we go. And now I can go ahead and sew my bottom patchwork to complete the bottom of the front of my bag. Oh my goodness, look how cute. That would even make a really cute pillow if you are looking for a fun pillow finish. You could add um, backing fabric and make that a cute little pillow. As big as the 25 count fabric is, I think that could even be like more of a couch pillow or something like that instead of a dough bowl or tiered tray pillow finish. So I like to pin when I am working with patchwork nesting seams. I do not want my patchwork shifting at all. So I just pull the pin right before my needle gets to it. Oh. I see that my machine came unthreaded. I just love when that happens so much. <laughs> so uh, now I have to repin. I didn't quite realize I'd left that in. It happens, it happens to all of us, right? 
let me know. <laughs> I hope it's not just me. But again, it's worth that extra effort to repin. I do not like to seam rip. Just like we don't like to frog, I don't like to seam rip. So if at all possible, I try to avoid it unless it's very necessary. And so cute. I'm going to give that a really good press. And then I am going to temporarily, well, I use um, some spray, basting spray between the stitched piece and my foam stabilizer. So I'm using soft and stable. I do want to mention I did not put interfacing on the back of my cross stitch piece because I think it's secure enough against the soft and stable that I didn't feel interfacing was needed. Now I am doing half inch quilting at the diagonal. I personally love half inch quilting. I love it at a diagonal. I know it's a little bit crazy because it's teeny tiny, <laughs> but I love a very dense quilted look. Um, I don't always do this, but it's one of my favorite. And I really love when I am doing my own quilting, um, I only do straight line quilting, but when I am doing my own quilting, I personally love the diagonal because it feels a little more forgiving um, than some other. I like other quilting and I do other quilting as well, but you will see this probably, I don't know, 80% of the time from me. I just really love how um, forgiving it is. Now, the one thing I want to mention is I am avoiding my cross stitch. This does make a little bit more work. If I were to maybe just follow the quilted um, two and a half inch square design, I probably could have eliminated a little bit of this quilting. Or if I'd gone horizontally or something, you could completely eliminate, you know, a lot of going around your cross stitch piece. However, I didn't mind that little bit extra work. So that is what I'm going to do. You're going to see me quilt it here in a minute. I'm going to flip this around the other direction to draw my lines. I do draw my lines and I like to use this heat erasable marker. When I am done quilting, I take it to my iron, I iron it and remove the lines. Now, do those black lines show up on those black squares? They sure do not. I also use a chalk pen or pencil, which I do think I get out here in a little bit. You'll see that just to kind of help serve as a guideline for where do my lines go? How is this going to look? Um, all of that. This is not my favorite part of the project. Uh, I'm going to be completely honest. However, I have learned that I particularly love, there's my basting spray. I love my quilting to look a certain way and I cannot sew straight to save my life. So I find that drawing the lines is so worth it because I didn't have to redo anything for this. And that is what we're looking for. We're looking to not have to redo things or pick things out or anything like that. Here's that chalk. Now, if you wipe your hand across it, it disappears. So I love it. I'll link both of those down below. I wanna just make sure it's not pulled wonky. And that looks good. Once I have it, we're gonna take it over to the machine. I will put my walking foot on and we are going to quilt this up. So I did put the walking foot on and what I do when I start is I generally will stitch down one direction and I do want to back stitch where it is in the middle of the bag. If I am out in the soft and stable or batting, whatever you're using, I usually don't back stitch out there. And then I like to go the other direction. It does help with some wonkiness that may occur. The basting spray also helps that kind of not happen, but I do like to start that direction. And again, it's just kind of a pain to do, do the quilting in such little lines. We're not going all the way across the bag, but it's worth it. It doesn't take that terrible long to achieve. And I think it takes longer to draw the lines than to actually sew them, to be honest. So, um, just take your time with this. It is so worth it. 
and quilt however you want. If you like free motion quilting, if you want to do horizontal quilting, which as I mentioned a little bit ago, would take a lot less effort and there would be no the, not, not so much starting and stopping, that would be amazing as well. Or you could follow the lines of your patchwork, whatever you like, do that. I always say, do what makes you happy. And, um, as short as these lines are up above the up above my cross stitch piece, they're even shorter, <laughs> but that is okay. Um, we are going to end up with an amazing bag when this is all said and done and a great way to utilize maybe some of those cross stitch pieces. Now I am trying to trim up threads. There will be a little bit. I do have an automatic thread cutter on this machine actually both my machines, I have automatic thread cutter and it does leave like a little tiny tail, you know, a half inch or so. Um, so you do kind of have to go through and trim those up. So I do, sometimes I do it as I'm going, sometimes I do several and then I come back and trim those up, whatever you like to do. And you can see the chalk lines are already, as the walking foot is going over those, it is already kind of, <laughs> erasing, not erasing necessarily, but you can see how they get kind of, um, I don't know. It's like chalkboard basically. It is chalk. So it, it, it'll go away with a little brush when you're all finished, but the other black lines will require some heat to get rid of them. And just watch your corners. You can see it may have the tendency to, because I maybe didn't get the basting spray all the way out to the corner. It may have a tendency to want to roll up. I always like to just make sure that um, they're nice and flat with no wonkiness. And we're going the other direction. So I am going to continue quilting. I will tell you for the back of the bag, I did the exact same thing obviously replacing um, two rows for the stitched area and then a row, another row. So basically I added three rows to the back of the bag that are not here on the front quilted panel so that it measures exactly what it does for the front. I am not going to quilt the row up above the zipper on my bag. And the reason being, I didn't want to quilt that area. It tends to get a little tight. So I'm going to use a solid piece of fabric up there instead. I do kind of like that. You can totally do a solid piece of fabric for the back of your bag. If you have done this and you're like, yep, I am done with patchwork, no more patchwork, you can totally do that. For this one, because I had all of those extra squares, I opted to go ahead and do exactly what I did, um, you know, for the front of the bag, but just a lot more squares for the back. I did all of this in one afternoon, um, the whole bag from start to finish, figuring out how it was going to work. Yes, I did have the benefit of that previous snowman bag tutorial, but, um, trying to figure out and make it all work together. That bag was not patchwork. It was a pieced block. Um, so this one is a little bit different. I know if you guys are like me, you love the patchwork look. And so that's definitely what I was going for with this. So I am going to speed this up a lot. You can definitely slow it down if you want to watch it slower. Um, but I wanted to leave it in just to kind of show this whole process. I do recommend leave your batting or soft and stable bigger than your quilt panel or your bag panel. That way it gives you a little bit of room. You'll notice I will trim this all down here in a little bit, but just to start with, I find it's helpful to have it bigger and then you can always have a little play because there will be some seam allowance, obviously, with the sides of the bag. So if you have to have a little soft and stable, let's say your quilting um, isn't totally square, then you can do that. But if this worked out pretty well, iron, I can't emphasize enough, make sure everything is ironed really well. And then make sure when you use the uh, basting spray that it is nice and secure. 
Okay, so now I'm going to trim this down. I did iron it off camera. Um, so you'll notice all my little black lines are gone. And I am simply squaring up the front part of my bag panel. And look at all of those extra squares. We have not created the back of the bag yet. I am going to skip to that in a little bit. In fact, I left a little, there's a little bit of the soft and stable showing as I am squaring up my bag. That may go away. Um, in fact, I believe it does when I square this panel up with the back panel of the bag. But we're just, I like to kind of just work one part at a time. Oh, it's looking good. I love it so much. Okay, so here's my snowman bag. I am using it as a guide to see how close it is. It looks pretty close to me. I'm very happy with that. Okay, next up, let's go ahead and sew, piece, sew, and quilt the back of the bag. For the back of the bag, I really do like adding a label to it. So I'm going to square up my panel. You can see that it is seven by six, the back of my bag. And in fact, you could do this for the front and the back. If you do not um, have a cross stitch piece and it's, or maybe it's not the same size, whatever the case may be, you could always just make a patchwork bag. And I think that would be super cute. This is a label from the Sweetwater Company. I'm gonna kind of look and see where I want it. I do a little uh, quick, iron and then I do take it over to my sewing machine. I like to stitch it on. I think it looks super cute that way. So I am just going to go around the edges. I did do it off center. I really liked how it kind of centers those six two and a half inch squares and I leave about an eighth of an inch all the way around the label and then I simply stitch it on. Okay I have the front and the back of my bag together. And the front of my bag is slightly wonky to the back or the back is slightly wonky. It is not a lot. You can see it is barely anything, but I am going to square that up so that my bag goes together nicer. And I have this wonderful by Annie zipper. I love these zippers. They have a really nice big circle at the end, meaning if you like to hang char charms from them, they work fantastic. So that's one of the reasons I particularly love these. All right, that looks really good. And I am just making sure now all of my sides are square. Not really taking off a ton. It's just a little bit. Now we need lining fabric. And I had plenty of fat quarters for this. I actually had two fat quarters. So we're going to use up the rest of the fat quarter I used for the two and a half inch squares from this, and I'm going to leave it long. Turning my zipper upside down, I am going to clip it with some clover clips to the top of the front of my bag. And then I, I'm not gonna cut down the lining yet. I am simply going to clip this in place, like so. And then we are going to take it over to the sewing machine and we are going to stitch. I actually just use my regular um, foot for this. I don't use my quarter inch foot. Um, I don't use a zipper foot on the Juki. I find I don't really need it, especially with these zippers. Now, before I take it over to the machine, I am just going to trim off some of this excess, making sure my zipper's out of the way. I like to leave my zipper long for now. We'll trim it down in a minute and we're gonna go sew. So I need to take my walking foot off. Just going to move that out of the way. I've already done all of my quilting. I do try to do my quilting all at once. It doesn't, I'm not always successful, but I do really try. And then I always like to make sure my foot's on nice and secure and Make sure we have a regular stitch length, not our long stitch length. I did increase my stitch length for um, the quilting to about four. I'm da back down to like one and three quarters, two inches for the regular stitching. And I am going to sew and then I back stitch at both ends. I'm gonna flip the lining to the inside of the bag and then I'm gonna give that a really good press at my iron before we add the top of the bag. Okay, so for the top of the bag, I have much 
extra down here at the bottom. So I am going to cut that and I am going to cut a two and a half inch strip. And we're actually gonna use both pieces. So I'm just using it not only for the top of the bag, but the lining. So this two and a half inch strip is front to front. So I am placing that face down towards the front of my bag. Again, clipping it to my zipper. I'm gonna flip it over or place the linings front to front as well. And again, it's okay to leave it long. We're going to trim it all up here in a little bit. And I just wanna make sure, you can use pins if you want to. I just find that these clips work really well for uh, basically the rest of the construction of the bag. Um, I'm a big fan of clips and pins, whichever. <laughs> And then we will run this over to the sewing machine and we're going to stitch again. And this means now that we have the front of the bag and the front lining of the bag all sewn together. And I did trim off the rest of that zipper. It was getting a little long and in the way. But the other end I have left right as is. We will trim this all down once we have our zipper in place. And again, as I sew down, I just pull my clips. I keep my little bin right there so that I can, as I pull, I can just throw them in. I do the same thing for my pin cushion and I am adjusting. One thing I did not do, you could, after you flip these top stitch to kind of keep it away from the zipper. I really find I don't need to, but that is an option if you're interested. So again, gonna run that over and iron it really well. And then I open the zipper halfway. I like to use some straight pins to help hold the bag together and kind of square because now we're going to square up the front of the bag. And that means all of the excess needs to go and we do not wanna trim off the zipper pull and make our zipper unusable. That would be a terrible situation. <laughs> So I am just kind of being very conscious and aware of that. The zipper pull does get in the way a little of, of trimming down and I literally just do the best I can. What I try to line up with first is like the blocks and things in my actual patchwork. Um, just again, squaring it up as much as possible. Same thing here with the top of the bag. I'm going to trim it to two and a quarter. Uh, remember that top strip is two and a half, so we've sewn a quarter inch into our zipper. So I feel like two and a quarter is correct. And now I'm gonna use a clip to hold those two ends together. I also need the back lining and I have another fat quarter. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna trim this down. So I am not cutting the best, but that's okay. We're just going to trim that and put the rest of our fat quarter away. There's still lots on there. And now we have our lining in the back. So we're going to take our back of our bag and place the back and the front, front to front. So the back of the bag on top of the front of the bag and clip them together up at the top. Then we already have our lining for the front and we're going to do our back lining and we're going to do these front to front. So right side to right side. And then we're going to sew all the way across the top of the bag with a quarter inch seam. And at this point, it is all about the steps to finish. We are almost done with our bag. I love a bag without binding, don't you? So over at my sewing machine, we are going to sew with a quarter inch. I backstitched at the beginning and the end, pulling my pin or my clips as I went. Backstitch. Oh, I think I actually didn't use my quarter inch foot, but now I put it on. Good news, that was real fast. Okay, now we want to sew the front of our bag together, same thing. At the bottom of the bag, we're going to sew these together in a straight line, and the lining we're going to sew together, but we are going to leave an opening. 
I would leave a pretty significant opening in the bottom of your bag lining to turn your bag right side out. And remember, my zipper is partly halfway open. So the front of the bag, back stitch at the front at the beginning. We're gonna go all the way to the end and back stitch again. Then we're gonna take the lining of the bag. We're going to stitch down part of the way. We're gonna back stitch. Then we're going to leave a big opening and we are going to um, back stitch the other side. So there you can see I left a big opening and I went all the way down the other. So I can now turn the bag after I have sewn the sides. So for the sides of the bag, we are now going to sew all four layers, the two lining layers and the front and the back of the bag together. For this, I am again using the clover clips. And this is my little tip for this. I personally love starting at the top of the bag and sewing down to the bottom because remember our lining and the bottom of our bag are separate pieces. The top is all sewn together and our sides are sewn together. And so by doing that, I just feel like it lays nicer, if that makes sense. So I'm starting at the top of the bag and sewing down the side with a quarter inch seam. Back stitch at each end to secure. Then I flipped it over and we're going to do the same thing down the other side, just removing our clips as we go, making sure it is straight as possible. And then I like to take my scissors. Oh, I, I'm so excited. Don't forget, notch your corners. So I'm taking nice sharp scissors, notching my corners so that I can get the sharpest points possible. And then we are going to turn our bag right side out. I have a point turner as well that I'm going to use. And what I suggest is work slowly, gently, as gentle as you can, just start working the bag right side out, pushing as careful. And then as you get it, go ahead and stick your hand in there into that little hole you've left in the lining and gentle, gentle, gentle with your um, point turner tool, work those corners out. I just kind of use a little twisty motion to work those corners as pointy as possible without sticking my point turner through the corner of the bag. That is always the goal. So gentle, gentle. One more, it looks like. I always like to poke it out with my fingers first and then I put the point turner in there. Now at this point, give your bag a good iron. Give it a super good iron. Make sure everything looks good. Oh my word, you guys, how cute is this? I love it so much. Uh, make sure it's ironed really, really well and then pull your lining up and we want to clip or pin the, the seam in place and we're going to sew up that hole in our bag. You can hand stitch it. It is a little tricky, but I just find, I'm gonna remove some little strings that are hanging. I just kind of fold it in and then I pin it and I machine stitch mine. It is in the bottom of the bag. If you go and look in the bottom of my bag and you know, don't love how it looks, then I just think nobody's gonna be looking basically. I'm gonna hang on a cute charm. I have this little handmade charm and my bag is all finished. Thank you guys so much for joining me today for this project bag tutorial showcasing how to create a bag with no binding, no exposed seams and how to utilize a cross stitch design into your project bag. The supplies I used are listed and linked below the video here on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining and we'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel, click that like button, and don't forget to hit the notification bell to always be notified when I have a new floss tube stitching or quilting video. Thank you guys so much for joining me today and we'll see you next time.